Hello again. In this uh, video lecture, we're going to talk about a few disorders of hemostasis, things that can lead to problems with uh, either you not being able to form blood clots or maybe you're forming blood clots when you don't need to be forming blood clots or two different angles you could go at there. All right, first of all, what about undesirable blood clot formation? These are disorders that fall into the thromboembolic category, thromboembolic disorders, undesirable blood clot formation that occurs inside your blood vessels. We have those and then bleeding disorders are where you don't coagulate your blood properly. These are often, not always, but they're often genetic defects. If you guys remember, genes are chemical recipes that tell your cells how to make particular proteins. Well, most of your clotting factors are proteins. So if you have a defect in one or more of those genetic recipes for your blood clotting factors, you're not going to be able to blood your clot, uh, blood your clot, clot your blood properly. Finally, there's a third type of disorder called disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC is easier to say. Um, you guys will hear about DIC during your careers because you'll probably encounter patients who have this. And um, the name tells us what it is. So intravascular means inside your blood vessels, coagulation, blood clotting. Disseminated means it's spread throughout the body. So that's a um, a pretty nasty condition where you wind up with little tiny blood clots inside your blood vessels that are forming all throughout the body um, at once. All right, so let's talk about some thromboembolic conditions. What's the difference? All right, we have a thrombus is a term you guys should know, and then an embolus is a term you guys should know, and an embolism is a term you guys should know as well. A thrombus is a clot that develops inside an unbroken blood vessel. So the wall has not been broken all the way through. So here we've got an image of this taking place over here. But notice the endothelium, the inner lining of this blood vessel, has been damaged. And it's been damaged. You see there's some fatty deposits there within the wall of the blood vessel. This is what happens to a lot of us as we uh, get older and for many Americans now it's not even when you get older it's happening at younger and younger ages due to our poor diets. This can set off the blood coagulation processes that we talked about before. You can form a platelet plug, the platelets start attracting in the coagulation factors and pretty soon you've got an unwanted blood clot that's here. Alright, so if a thrombus develops in an artery that's leading to your brain, you might have a stroke. If it develops in an artery um, that's supplying blood to some area uh, of the heart, it can cut off the oxygen supply and cause those tissues to die and you can wind up having a heart attack. Um, now sometimes you have a thrombus, an internal clot that develops in one area and then it travels, it detaches and starts flowing through the bloodstream. That's called an embolus when that happens. You may have heard, you've probably heard about people getting blood clots in their legs. Um, like if you're bedridden for a long period of time and you're not walking around and using your legs. Um, the blood, one of the things that helps prevent unwanted blood clotting is the flow of blood, the natural flow of blood. It helps prevent coagulation factors from accumulating and triggering a blood clot to form in an unwanted manner. Well, if you're like sitting on an airplane for a long period of time, you know how they tell you to get up and walk around? Um, it helps prevent unwanted blood clots from forming in the, the veins down in your lower legs. And sometimes when that happens, they can detach. And um, as we'll learn shortly here in the class, veins bring blood back to your heart and then your heart pumps the blood out to the lungs so that the blood can become oxygenated. It can pick up oxygen gas there. So if you have an embolus that gets pumped by the heart out to the lungs, like they're showing you over here, it can get trapped in blood vessels within the lungs. And if it's a big enough clot, it can cut off the blood supply to the majority of one of your lungs, and that can be fatal. You can also have cerebral emboli. Emboli is the plural of embolism. And uh, that's where these clots get trapped in an artery that's leading to the brain. And um, that can also be fatal or cause a pretty serious stroke. What are some risk factors for these types of things? 
atherosclerosis. That's what you're seeing up here. That's where you have hardening of the walls of the arteries. Uh, and usually that's due to fatty deposits that take place there. Slowly flowing blood, like I was just mentioning, if you're inactive, like you're bedridden, you're at risk for developing unwanted blood clots, especially down in the veins of your legs, which we'll learn more about why that is as we move through the next, uh, the next couple of units. Inflammation. So in, uh, we talked a little bit about the inflammation process before. There are chemical signals during inflammation that help promote uh, platelets coming in and forming platelet plugs and setting off that blood coagulation process. So anything that triggers inflammation as well can cause this. There's a school of thought also that the diet that we eat, the modern diet, we're not all that well adapted to. And a lot of us have low levels of inflammation going on um, within our cardiovascular systems on a pretty regular basis. And so that's uh, one of the things that's also thought to contribute to the high levels of heart disease that we have in our country where we have quite a few people who wind up with unwanted clots in the blood vessels that supply their heart and that can cause heart attacks. How do we um, prevent unwanted blood coagulation? Um, you've probably heard of people like after they've had a heart attack or, or have heart disease they may take low doses of aspirin um, on a pretty regular basis. So how does that work? You know, aspirin, you think about taking that for a headache. And uh, aspirin works because it inhibits chemical messengers that are called prostaglandins. And if you guys remember on the endocrine system, um, we talked about hormones. We briefly mentioned paracrine compounds. Those are chemical compounds that tend to act locally and send uh, signals to neighboring cells. So prostaglandins are a type of paracrine chemical messenger, and they're used for lots of different purposes in the body. So prostaglandins do things like um, trigger fever responses up in the hypothalamus, your brain's thermostat. Um, prostaglandins are involved in pain signaling, and in prostaglandins, one type is thromboxane, is a type of prostaglandin. You may remember on the platelet lecture I mentioned that thromboxane is one of those chemical signals that's made by platelets that helps recruit in other platelets so that they stick together and form a platelet plug. So aspirin actually reduces the synthesis of prostaglandins in the body and that's why aspirin is so good at inhibiting multiple different things. That's why you can take this one pill and reduce your pain, reduce fever, and uh, it even helps prevent blood clotting. Um, heparin is another drug that can be given and uh, this is an anticoagulant so it helps prevent um, the unwanted clotting of blood. Uh, warfarin, maybe you've heard of warfarin before Coumadin is another name for this and uh, this is a drug that's sometimes given to patients who have atrial fibrillation. That's where, so your heart's divided up into four chambers. The upper two are called the atria. The bottom two are called the ventricles. You know, as you get older, some people develop atrial fibrillation where the atria are not really contracting normally. They just kind of do these little minor contractions over and over again. And that tends to screw up your blood flow. So you're uh, more likely to have unwanted coagulation when you have that type of condition. So sometimes those patients are given warfarin or coumadin and what it does is it interferes with vitamin K. And if you guys remember, vitamin K is needed by the liver to make four different clotting factors. So if you're on this particular drug, you're not going to have as many clotting factors as you normally would. You know, the key here is not to completely wipe out synthesis of your coagulation factors because then you'd be likely to bleed to death pretty easily. But you just want to reduce their concentrations so you don't form unwanted blood clots quite as easily. All right, another type of drug that can be given to patients at time is, times is dabigatran, and uh, it directly inhibits thrombin. So if you guys remember, thrombin is the enzyme that takes 
fibrinogen and converts it over to fibrin. So if you don't have this around or it's not quite as active, you're not going to be able to make clots quite as easily. All right, some bleeding disorders that people can have. Um, thrombocytopenia. Remember, leukopenia meant an abnormally low number of leukocytes. Thrombocytopenia is an abnormally low uh, number of thrombocytes, also known as platelets. Obviously, we've learned that platelets are very important in blood coagulation, so if you're not making these at adequate levels, you're not going to be able to clot your blood quite as uh, efficiently. Uh, a sign and symptom of this would be petechiae that form, and uh, that is a name that refers to little microscopic um, blood vessel hemorrhages that can occur near the surface of the skin. And um, now those happen all the time. You know, every time you're you bump into something, or you know, even when you sneeze and cough and things like that, you cause little microscopic blood vessel ruptures uh, in the face. And ordinarily, platelets come in and seal off those torn blood vessels right away and you don't experience much blood loss from that. But if you have thrombocytopenia, you can't do that quite as well. So you might see ruptured blood vessels, evidence of that in the whites of the eyes, um, in the thinner skin around the eyes, and even other parts of the skin as well, like in this patient down here around the foot. All of the, all those spots that you see there are due to rupturing of blood vessels near the surface of the skin and that they bleed for a long period of time before they actually get closed off. So anything that destroys red bone marrow can lead to this like we've talked about before. Uh, cancers like um, leukemias, radiation exposure, drugs that damage the red bone marrow. If you have less than 50,000 platelets per microliter, that's one one millionth of, your, of a liter, that's like a little pinprick drop, uh, that's when you're considered to have this particular disorder. You can give patients transfus transfusions of just platelets to help them uh, counteract that type of problem. Um, bleeding disorders can also be caused if your liver is not functioning properly. That makes sense because we've talked about that your liver over here makes most of those or makes uh, those procoagulants which are proteins that are in the inactive form in the blood that have to be converted into the coagulants or clotting factors to help you make those fibrin clots. So various things can cause this, a vitamin K deficiency. Now we just talked about how you might take warfarin to deliberately screw up vitamin K so you don't make too many of these procoagulants. But um, other things, hepatitis, if you have inflammation of the liver and the liver's not functioning properly, it's not going to make these proteins. Cirrhosis, that's where you have um, damage to the liver tissues. A lot of times that's due to excessive consumption of alcohol. Alcohol, uh, your liver processes alcohol and helps remove that from the body, but if you drink too much of it, it winds up killing your liver cells. Um, some other things, if you can't absorb fats from your diet, vitamin K is actually what's called a fat soluble vitamin. So it's dissolved in the fats that we take in from our diets. And if you can't absorb fats properly from your intestinal tract, you won't be able to take in vitamin K as well. And um, you actually need, in order to be able to dissolve fats from your diet, you need to produce bile. Bile is a substance that helps you uh, break down fats. It's kind of like the dishwashing detergent of your digestive system. It helps uh, dissolve fats from the foods that we eat so that you can absorb them from the intestinal tract down here better. So your liver actually makes bile. So if your liver is not functioning properly, that's another reason you're not going to be, it uh, might reduce your production of these procoagulants because you're not going to be able to absorb vitamin K properly from your diet. All right, and then we also have hemophilia. You've probably heard of hemophiliacs before. So these are genetic conditions or hereditary conditions. That means you um, inherit them where you have a defective gene or genes that code for genes or genetic recipes for proteins. And most of these clotting factors we've been talking about are proteins. So if your genetic recipes are screwed up in some way for one or more of these, you may wind up with hemophilia. 
All right, so hemophilia A, this is the most common type of hemophiliac disorder. 77% of hemophilia cases um, involve this. And this is where you don't make factor VIII properly, clotting factor VIII. So you guys can go back and look at where that fits in on the, the pathways of blood clotting. Um, hemophilia B is a factor IX deficiency, and hemophilia C is a factor XI deficiency. The more severe types may impact both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, whereas uh, the milder types will impact just one of the two. So a lot of times you can still, in milder cases, you can still clot blood. It just takes longer for it to happen. So you'll have prolonged periods of bleeding, um, even into your joint cavities. You know, if you think about it, your joints have a blood supply, so you have blood vessels around your joints. You use those joints all the time, so you have little microscopic tears that take place in those blood vessels, and they can wind up leaking um, blood into the joint cavity fluids into those spaces that are there. Uh, traditionally, these have been treated by receiving transfusions of plasma from blood donors, and then... Today, more and more, we're able to genetically make blood clotting factors through genetic engineering, which reduces the need for hemophiliacs to have blood plasma transfusions. The bad thing about blood tra plasma transfusions, you're getting those from another person, and even though um, you know blood donations, of course, are screened, but you have to be careful because uh, you know there is sometimes some risk of picking up a microorganism from a blood transfusion. In the past, there was a big problem with uh, hemophiliacs picking up hepatitis and HIV from donated blood. Of course, blood today is extensively tested for both of those viruses before it's given to patients. All right, what about that third type of disorder we talked about, disseminated intravascular coagulation? This is both, both an unwanted clotting and an unwanted bleeding disorder that takes place. So you wind up with these little microscopic blood clots that form within blood vessels all throughout the body. And essentially what happens is that uses up your blood clotting factors. There's so much, so many of these little microscopic blood clots forming, your blood clotting factors get used up. So then you can't clot blood like you really need to. So you wind up with, um, you know, widespread bruising and petechia, things like that. You know, anytime you bump into something that's going to create a bruise, due to blood vessels leaking blood for a long period of time before clotting can take place. And this can be very dangerous because you can have internal hemorrhaging as well that might wind up killing you. Interestingly, this can occur as a pregnancy complication. Um, septicemia. <clears throat> septicemia means that you have microorganisms in your blood, usually bacteria, and um, that triggers inflammation and inflammation, we said, was something that can trigger blood clotting. So that can set this whole, if you have bacteria in the blood, that can set off this disseminated intravascular coagulation problem. Incompatible blood transfusions, you get the wrong blood type. That's something else that can cause this to happen as well. So this can be pretty bad news. This can ultimately wind up killing patients in some, uh, in some cases. All right, uh, last video lecture for chapter 17, we're going to talk about blood transfusions and blood type and what happens if you get the wrong types of blood.